Hi, this is Amanda, Chris's nutrition coach. I help him keep his belly from actually looking like a peach. But first, check this out. It takes the average student loan borrower about 19 years to pay back their student loans. And for graduate students, I think it's about 23 years. And what's so harmful about that is one, it's taking forever, but when they take it, the surveys they do of these students, when they take out the loans, when they're in school, they think they're gonna pay them off by about the time they're 30. Alrighty, everyone, this is the Money Peach Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Peach, and I'm going to be bringing on some of the most amazing people I can find so they can tell you how they do their life and their money the right way. Today's guest on the show is Jordan Hall. He is the author of the book, Every Degree Debt Free. Jordan talks about how he went to undergrad and even went to law school and paid his way through college so he could graduate, get this, without a student loan. It's crazy, right? Who out there is graduating now debt-free? It's not common, but it's possible. And I wanted Jordan to come on the show to talk about how he did it, the sacrifices he had to make, but how he is absolutely winning without that student loan. So without further ado, let me bring on Jordan Hall, author of Every Degree Debt-Free. Jordan Hall, thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, Excited to have you on. The reason why we're bringing you on, Jordan, is we found your book, Every Degree Debt-Free. And right away, that sparked my interest because, you know, I love talking about unique ways to go through school or pay off debt or do anything where we don't have to carry debt. And you're the subject matter expert. You came on the show. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Chris. I am excited and honored to be on the show. So Jordan, let us know where you're calling in from. I'm here in Phoenix. Where are you at? I am in Frankfurt, Kentucky. That is the capital of Kentucky. And the reason why I know that is my son is memorizing capitals of every state. And I remember that was the <sighs> one. I'm like, Frankfurt, Kentucky. Nobody knows that. I'm going to know that. So Frankfurt, Kentucky. Am I right, by the way? No, you're exactly right. I'm impressed that you know it because the old joke is, how do you pronounce the capital of Kentucky, Louisville or Louisville? And it's actually Frankfurt. So, All right. So <laughs> the reason why, like I just said, mentioned about the intro of you coming on the show is so you are convincing people that they do not have to take out a student loan. They don't have to go deeply <laughs> in debt. And so this is kind of against the grain, right? I mean, it's becoming, you know, we had somebody on the show a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about how in the 1920s, maybe 1% to 2% of people had a mortgage. And by the 1960s, mm-hmm. it was 85% of people had mortgages. There was this big shift. And yep. so years and years ago, I mean, most people, even when I was in college, I'm 35 years old, but when I was going to school, I would say it was maybe 50, 50 took out a student loan. Mm-hmm. And now it's just completely normal. It's like breathing air. And it's refreshing to have somebody come on that finally agrees with me that you don't have to have <laughs> a student loan. But before we jump into how this is going to work, give us a little bit of a background on you. I mean, how did you get to this point where you're talking about this today? Sure. No, you're exactly right. That's one of the main points I try to get across to people is it hasn't always been this way with student loans. Student loans as we know them now really only came about in the 21st century, and they weren't even a big deal until probably the late 1990s. And since then, they've grown a lot. But as far as me, I kind of got into this whole debt-free mindset. Actually, when I was a little kid, when I was a, a young teen, my parents went through some really rough financial times In fact, my mom, one evening when I was 13 years old, it was about a month before Christmas, she called me into her bedroom and she was wrapping presents and getting ready for Christmas. And she said, Jordan, I have some news for you. And she said, just want to let you know, prepare you. Christmas is not going to be this year what it was last year. And up until that point, you know, I grew up kind of middle class, two older brothers, younger sister. We had a nice house and never really worried about money or anything. But my dad was kind of a serial entrepreneur. He was always trying different things. And he had been setting up this business that he was about to start, and he had borrowed tons of money for it. But just a month or two before Christmas, he was actually on our roof making some repairs. He fell off, shattered his hip, and that threw him out of work. And it also called due all the loans he had taken out for this new business he was starting. So that night, my mom called me into the room. She was calling me in to let me know that our family was basically going broke. Christmas was going to be a lot different. And going forward, A lot of things were going to be different. They weren't going to be able to buy me a car when I turned 16. It didn't look like they were going to be able to help me with college at all. In the beginning, I was really, you know, it it was, uh, I won't say it was traumatizing, but I was frustrated. But pretty quickly, as I watched my parents have to dig themselves out of debt, I kind of was like, okay, I'm going to figure this money stuff out while I'm young, and I'm not going to put my family through this. And uh, actually, my parents went through uh, Dave Ramsey's class. I mean, this is back 
when he was a lot smaller than he is today. This was 2003. And I tagged along to one of those classes, and it was just like, it all made sense. I saw you know, the part where he puts up the Ben and Arthur chart, and you see how much money somebody can have if they start saving money when they're young. And I just really latched on to that. And pretty soon, actually that next spring, my older brothers, I've got two older brothers, they had a few lawns that they mowed for extra money, and I would get to pitch in with them from time to time. And from basically from that moment on, I just jumped into that business. And through high school, I helped them grow it. And I basically took over it. And that's what ended up paying my way through college, actually. And then ultimately, when I decided to go to law school, I didn't want to borrow money for that either. So I continued mowing grass all the way through law school. Actually, between college and law school, I mowed personally mowed over 5,000 lawns. That was kind of my main source of income. I did a bunch of other things, too. I ended up getting my real estate license and started a a little company doing home improvement work and stuff like that. But it was all kind of birthed out of my parents' financial mistakes. And it kind of, you could say it scarred me as far as debt goes, maybe, but it's all worked out pretty well. And here I am now. I graduated law school. I'm an attorney and I do a bunch of other stuff too. But I'm pretty hardcore on this message against student loans. And I think they are a huge detriment to society. And I, I think we're headed for a pretty bad place if something doesn't change. Jordan, there's a lot of parents listening right now, you know, like myself, you know, we have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, but there's somebody might be thinking, you know, I have a 17-year-old and I haven't saved a dime. They feel so guilty because I feel like there's this pressure put on parents that if they don't save up and pay for their kids' college education, they don't love them. And so one of the things that I've always said when I hear people say that, and we get that question quite a bit is like, you know, my son's 17 years old, he's going to college next year and he's going to have to take student loans out. And I'm like, no, there's an option three. The option three is he doesn't take out student loans and he hustles. And so I'm looking at some numbers right here. Just kind of throw these out there. So I went to Arizona State University. So I just Google just now. What is in-state tuition for Arizona State University? This is how crazy it is. When I was in school, I remember my tuition was $1,350, $1,350 a semester. That was in 2001. (laughs) Okay, so let's put that together annually, $1,350. So we're right around $2,600, $2,700 bucks a year. Okay. Mm-hmm. Looking at the cost of attendance now, it's saying for in-state tuition, it's $27,530. Well, I mean, what's going on here? Let's talk about that. Why is there this extreme growth or increase in tuition costs? And then the second part is I want to talk about is how can parents handle this? Well, you bring up some really good points. First of all, to the parent issue, actually, at the, in the very beginning of my book, I kind of addressed that. I think it's fantastic if parents can afford to pay some or all of their kids' college education, but I also don't think it's bad if they can't. My mom spoke very frankly to me, and honestly, that moment changed my life because she looked at me as a teen and said, we can't help you, but I know you can do it on your own. And some parents, that may seem bad, but to me, it was empowering. Like From that moment on, I said, you know what? I can do this. And so I believed because it was a powerful moment for me. And so many parents are denying their kids that moment because they, out of guilt or whatever, societal pressure, feel that they've got to cover college. Now, as far as the increase of college over the last 10 or 15 years, it has increased a whole lot. But one of the big factors in that is the unbridled lending that we've done. We're lending kids who have never made a dime, hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to school. And so they're indiscriminately going and getting degrees that maybe they shouldn't or they haven't thought through. They're going to schools that they really can't afford and they don't realize it because they're financing it all with debt. It's kind of all contributing to this ridiculous crisis that we're facing. Yeah. I mean, to your point there, it's out of control. And I always use this analogy. I've used this quite a bit. So if an 18 year old had this business idea, right, and walks into a bank, with no history of credit or no history of working or anything and says, you know what? I have this idea for a business and I would like to take out a $100,000 loan. The bank's going to say no. Yep. We don't just lend money to 18-year-olds because they feel like it's a good idea. College isn't that much different, right? Because there's no guarantee that there's going to be this return on it. So they go to the student loan company and they pull out a loan and it's an automatic yes. It's like if you breathe air and you ask, we say yes. Here you go. What's the difference there? I mean, why is it one is, I mean, an 18 year old can't go get a mortgage for $250,000 without, you know, any background, but yet they can go get a quarter million dollar education. Yeah, exactly. And and the reason for that is that the government is now backing these loans. They've made them non-bankruptable and they've backed them themselves. So the student loan companies are going to get their money. That's one of the really harmful things about student loans is that they're non-bankruptable and the only way they get paid off is if the student pays them off, they could become disabled permanently or they die. This is not like credit card debt 
that can be discharged in bankruptcy. It's not even like mortgage debt because you don't have a real asset and you can call education an asset. And I believe it is. But a lot of people are going hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and they're not even finishing their degrees. So it's really, really harmful. And a lot of our government policies that are, have good intentions, I have no doubt, are what is kind of driving this. I mean, like you said, you walk in and breathe air and you can get a student loan and get a, a ridiculous amount. I mean, people say that I have an extreme position in saying that you should seek to go to school without any student loans. I think the opposite is extreme. To lend an 18-year-old $200,000 when they've never made a dime, that's the definition of extreme. And it's extremely harmful. Yeah. So there you go. People say, oh, Jordan, you're so extreme. You should save up money and work your way through school. You know, that's child abuse in in our culture. The other way is just as bad. Okay. So instead, go to school, get a loan. And I mean, there's people in their 60s, Jordan, that I was just reading that still have student loans. Yep. It takes the average student loan borrower about 19 years to pay back their student loans. And for graduates, students, I think it's about 23 years. What's so harmful about that is, one, it's taking forever But when they take it, the surveys they do of these students, when they take out the loans, when they're in school, they think they're going to pay them off by about the time they're 30. And that's one of the main really harmful things about student loan debt is not only are you making loans to people who can't really afford them, they don't even realize it. Their expectations are not in line with reality. I mean, everybody knows you're 35. You know, when you were 22 and I'm 28, I know when I was 22, I didn't have the understanding, the long-term vision that I do now. The way you measure risk is different when you're that age. The prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that measures risk, doesn't develop until you're 25. But nonetheless, we're allowing these students to make these decisions that are really harming them for the rest of their lives. And it's really terrible. And uh, we haven't touched on, to go back to you, you know, you said Arizona State is around $27,000 all in. I think that's a little bit higher than the average. The numbers that College Board is reporting right now is about $20,000 a year for your average bachelor's degree. That's tuition, books, fees, and living expenses. And $20,000 a year is a lot, but a kid who works 20 hours per week during the semester and 40 hours a week during the summer can make eighteen dollars or $19,000 a year at 11 or 12 bucks an hour. There's no reason the average student can't do that. Not very many of them do. I mean, how many college kids do you know who work 40 hours a week during the summer? But that's what people used to do who wanted to go to school. Our parents who wanted to go to school worked. They worked during school and they worked in the summers, and it was good. And that's what I did. That's how I paid for college, and then that's how I paid for law school. And I would not trade it for the world. I learned so much about business, about getting clients, about meeting deadlines, about managing time. Like I feel so much more prepared for the real world because of what I had to do in school. And we're depriving a lot of the kids these days of those experiences. So I think one of the ways that, I mean, this is just my opinion, this Money Peach podcast, everyone, I'm an expert in my opinion. But one of the, <laughs> one of the my opinions is we're basically creating wusses, right? We're creating yep. the wussification of society. And one of the ways we do that is we say, well, you know, I want you to go to school, junior, but I don't want you to work. I want you to focus on your studies. And at first, that's like, that's noble, right? You're being very kind there. You don't want your son or daughter to work in school. But let me show you how it is in the real world. Because when you become 35 years old and everybody out there listening can relate to this and you have two kids and a wife and a mortgage and health insurance and you got a bunch of different things, I don't get to call my parents and say, hey, mom, dad, this is really hard. Can I just do one of them? Like, I have two kids. Can I just, like, love one of them right now? And maybe you could take one for a month. It doesn't work like that, right? So I think when you tell your kids, like, I went to school and I wrestled. So wrestling itself felt like a full-time job. Then I was going to school. I wouldn't say I was, like, a star student. I was just, you know, pretty good. But then I also, on the weekends, I worked and I changed tires. Mm -hmm. And I look back at that going, it wasn't child abuse at all. I never even thought of it like that. I remember thinking, like, this is kind of hard. But, you know, it prepared me for life. So I always get this question, Jordan, is, Chris, how do you manage to be a full-time firefighter and then run your Money Peach blog, a podcast? And I'm like, I have really good time management skills. I learned them when I was changing tires, wrestling, and going to school full-time. Exactly. That's a great example of what I'm talking about. Those are the skills that I was forced to develop. It wasn't like I was doing this on purpose or I'm not even sure my parents put me in this position just to build character. And that sounds a little bit cliche, but it's true. I mean, you don't build much character sitting in your dorm watching Netflix and you're getting really good at Xbox. You build character by getting out there and investing in yourself. And when kids have an emotional stake in their education or even we're really not talking about kids here. We're talking about adults. I hate that we characterize 18, 19, 21, 22 year olds as kids. They're not kids. 
we've treated them as kids and for a long time. And so they're acting like kids, but they're not. You know, you bring up the point about grades. I was a pretty good student in college, even though I worked, I studied a lot. But I figured out, and I think just about anybody you talk to who's been out of school for a while realizes that grades you got in the classroom just weren't that big a deal. I mean, how many, you are, are running your own business here. You've got an incredibly successful podcast. How many people have asked you what your GPA was in school? I'm guessing none. I'm an attorney, a practicing attorney. People are yet to ask me what my GPA was in law school. And it wasn't very good. I'll be frank with you. I was working all the time. I worked during the semester, which people say you can't do. And I worked a lot during the summer. I did enough to pass my classes and ultimately to pass the bar, which is what really counted. The question I always go back to with people who bring this up, ultimately what I come back to is go find somebody who has $100,000 in student loans, that shouldn't be too hard to find, and ask them how many of their GPA points would they trade for every $10,000 in debt? And I think the answer to that question will tell you just about all you need to know. I love that question. I've never heard anybody say that before, and that makes so much sense. Because So here's another thing. You mentioned earlier about how... This is important for people. So just really, really focusing on this because I didn't realize how this is not really mainstream known. But we had one of our first financial coaching students that came through our program was ready to declare bankruptcy. And they had about 14000 in credit card debt. I think they had $10,000 on a car. And they had like seventy in student loan debt. And they were a physical therapist. So they had all this debt and they were declare bankruptcy. And I'm like, well, you know, you're declaring bankruptcy on $24,000 in debt. And a lot of this can be negotiated. And they're like, no, 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 no. I got this student loan over here. I'm like, we're not even paying attention to that. It's, that's not going away. And they looked at me confused. I said, you know, if you declare bankruptcy, you come out of bankruptcy, say hello to your student loan again. It's still there. And I'm like, that's what it means when it's guaranteed. To your point earlier, you had said the reason why they lend like crazy is because there's no risk for the lender anymore. It's guaranteed it's going to be paid back. Yep, you're exactly right. And that law changed, I believe, in 2006. And interestingly enough, if you look at the old graph of student loans, that's when you get to the end of the hockey stick and it just starts accelerating at a ridiculous pace. And like I said, I have no doubt that the government officials who put this into place had the best of intentions, but it's having some really, really bad repercussions and in the economy as a whole, and then in individual lives. I mean, I've got so many friends. Some of my best friends are now pharmacists and doctors and lawyers. This is another thing I talk in my book. Not only are they entering their professional lives way behind the eight ball because they've got mountains of student loan debt, but the reality is, and you know this, Chris, I cited in my book, I believe it's a nerd wallet study that says uh, only 27% of people end up working in their career or in their major field of study long term. So these people are now pigeonholed into a certain career because they borrowed hundreds of thousands of dollars to go get a degree in that field only to decide you know, when they're 28 or 38, I don't really want to do that anymore. And it's terrible. Yeah, I think the way things are today are much different than they were, say, 30 years ago. Most people, I mean, they don't stay in the same house for 40 years anymore. And hopefully they're dating or marrying the same woman or man for a lifetime. But beyond that, it seems like there's a lot of movement. It's very fluid. I meet so many people that they actually have planned that I'm going to work here for 10 years and I'm going to do something else. And I think that's totally okay. But you don't have that freedom when you went and spent a bunch of money and you're making you know, debt payments on a career choice you made when you were 18. You're exactly right. And that brings up another point in regard to all this. And I talk about this in my book. This is really the biggest thing to me, and it's what really stood out to me. You know, I said one of the big moments for me was when I was in that Dave Ramsey class and I saw the chart that showed how much money, if you start investing when you're young, how much money you can have. And I'm looking for the exact uh, number here. I believe the average payment on a student loan just for undergrad today is kids are graduating with an average of $37,000 in debt And that's a monthly payment of about $350. Like I said earlier, they don't pay that off for 21 years on average. If instead, if they could manage to graduate debt-free and invest that $350 a month for those 19 years, they would have over $300,000 by the end of that 19 years. And if they let that money sit by itself for another 10 years, they'd all be millionaires by the time they were 50. Instead, it's taking them 20 years, however long, to pay off all those loans. And by that point... All that compound interest, the time value of money is gone and wasted. And that's one of the biggest issues I see with, you know, we're not educating kids about what their money could be getting them. Hey guys, Chris Peach here. Hey, did you know Andrew and I were once living paycheck to paycheck and we had racked up $52,000 in consumer debt and only four years of marriage? 
Yeah, we were normal until we hit rock bottom. You see, since that moment, we decided to stop borrowing money, stop using credit cards, pay with cash, and then we did the unthinkable and we paid off $52,000 in only seven months. Sounds crazy, right? Well, maybe not as crazy as working nonstop to send all of our money to the bank in the form of payments. Here's the deal. I'm hosting a free workshop where I share our story and I show you the same step-by-step -step method to going from broke to debt-free and then on to building wealth. So head on over to moneypeach.com forward slash workshop to grab your spot in this free online training that I promise you are going to absolutely love. Once again, that's moneypeach.com forward slash workshop. Our audience is not 18 years old that's listening to this. If you're 18 years old, thank you for listening. But most of our audience are between average age 25 to 44 is what we're finding. We want to just scream at the top of our lungs and say, look, if you have a son or daughter any age, show them Google Ben versus Arthur. Show them the power of compound interest. Show them what happens with the, an example that Jordan just gives where instead of paying your student loan for 19 years – you have $300,000 that sits there and then you become a millionaire 10 years later with compound interest. That is motivational. Like that's the aha moment that people need to have. But it's our job because guess what? The schools are not teaching that, right? It's our job as parents that we need to teach that to people. And if you don't have any kids, then tell your friends about it. I mean, this is life changing stuff. So my next question, Jordan, I have for you is someone's listening to this right now. They're like, Jordan, give me the meat and potatoes. I want to know, how does a kid just decide that he's going to go to school without debt. I mean, I want you to take me through, I mean, you kind of mentioned it earlier, but I wanted you to take me through what it looks like. Like what did a day in the life of Jordan look like while you were going to school and working full time? Oh, sure. Actually, I've got several, got a kind of numbered steps here for anybody who wants to go to school debt-free or any kid who's thinking about pursuing that path, whether it's an undergrad degree or a graduate degree. The most important thing that you've got to do is you've got to select a school you can afford. And this kind of goes back to the, the student loan things. Young adults really don't pay any attention anymore to which school they get. They just go to whatever school they want to. They don't give any thought to whether or not they can afford it because they're going to walk into the student finance office and be lent as much money as they need. So the number one is to choose a school you can afford. In my case, I applied to three different undergrad institutions. One was a private school and two were public schools. Because of some of the scholarships and financial aid I received, it was actually cheaper for me to go undergrad to a private school. When it came to law school, I once again applied to three different schools. All three of those were public in-state schools, and I chose the one that was close to my hometown so I could continue working my lawn care business and pay reasonable tuition. I'm such a huge proponent of public in-state schools. I, I believe Arizona State's public and in-state for you, correct? Yes, we have three. We have Arizona yep. State, University of Arizona, which – no, I'm just kidding. It's fine. It's a good school. And then Northern <laughs> Arizona – or NAU is what we call it, but Northern Arizona, yeah. Yeah, so if you can afford, if you've got a windfall and you can afford to go to a private school and you really want to, that's fine. I'm not against private schools, but public schools are just much, much more affordable. And uh, at average right now, all in cost of about 20000 and And a kid can make that working, especially if they have help from mom and dad or get some scholarships. That leads me to the second point is scholarships. People do not realize how available scholarships are. Billions of dollars in scholarships go unclaimed every year According to the College Board, two-thirds of undergraduate students receive scholarships. 59% of graduate students receive scholarship. That means if you can get into school, you can probably get some level of scholarship. That doesn't mean a full ride. That means some help. And what I tell people is you're not trying to get it all covered by one scholarship or going to cover it all by working. Most people aren't going to do it that way. But if you can cobble together some resources, if you can choose a school you can afford, if you can get a little bit of scholarship money, if you can work some during the semester and a lot during summer, and maybe mom and dad can kick in some, you can absolutely do it. You know, getting back to my story, I worked probably more than the average kid is going to, but I, I loved working. When I was in, in undergrad, I would go to class. I'd wake up, go do my classes in the mornings. I tried to schedule them in the mornings so I could immediately after lunch drive back. I went to school about 30 minutes from my hometown here in Frankfurt, which is where most of my lawns were. And I would drive back and I would cut grass from about noon all the way till dark. And then I would study at night. I certainly didn't feel like that was child abuse. I enjoyed it. I would take time on campus to have fun. I don't want to act like I didn't have fun. I had plenty of fun. But there's definitely not an epidemic of too many kids working and missing out on fun on college campuses today. And that was kind of how I did it. When it came to law school, it was a little bit of a different animal because they do limit how much you can work during the semester. I was technically limited to 20 hours a week per semester. To be honest, I pushed that line quite a bit when I was in school. And my grades at times did suffer, especially right in the beginning. It's a big adjustment to go to a graduate degree. 
but I managed to pass my classes and I made that adjustment. And after a year or two, I figured out exactly where that balance was. Also, later in my career, I started selling real estate, which I still do today. And that was much more flexible because I could do that. A lot of that work is done on a computer. The real work is done on the weekends, showing houses. And then the work that you do during the week is done in an office and I could be studying. There's so many ways to make money while you're in school today. I mean, I didn't use anything sophisticated. I was cutting grass and doing other stuff like that. Kids today, young people, you know as well as anybody how much money you can make on the internet, so many different ways. There's just so much opportunity available that I hate to see somebody trade that to borrow fifty or $100,000 just so they can focus on their studies a little bit more. Yeah, you're right. There are so many ways to make money out there. You don't have to go and you know start your own business. I mean, you don't have to reinvent the wheel either. We'll put a link in the show notes, now that you just mentioned it, where we have a link. I think there's over 80, maybe 90 different side hustle ideas. I mean, cutting grass is one of them. Cleaning pools, that's what I did when I was getting out of debt. We cleaned Mm -hmm. pools. But we've had guests come on the show, and they share what they're doing. We add that to the list. Some of the things that I can think about are people that were in college but working, kind of unique jobs, is we had a student come on. And he created an app, and he was basically connecting the docks where people could rent out their driveways on campus. So, like, people that lived near the campus that were tired of the college students oh, yeah. parking. Yeah. Well, how about we rent out the driveway to somebody? The homeowner makes money, and he made a little kickback there. You know, volume-wise, he did pretty well. You know, we had another guy come on the podcast. He literally goes to large buildings, finds who's the property owner, and says, hey, you know, I'll pick up your trash for a fee because he realized that – This is kind of a pain in the butt job that no one wants to do. So he goes, I just do it on my own time. I go and pick up trash. And, uh, you know, over time, this guy generated like $100,000 a year picking up trash. It was crazy. (laughs) I wouldn't say that was like his go-to, like his income. But the point is, I mean, whether it's changing tires or mowing grass or doing something online or, you know, if you have a talent, play guitar, there are so many things you have to do. I think so many people think, Jordan, that, well, working to college means I'm working at the mall making minimum wage. And that is an option, but that's not the only option. There are other ways to do it. No, you're exactly right. I'm all for that if that's all you've got available to you. But most college kids, especially graduate students, can make much more than minimum wage. It's much more, it's easy to find jobs that are where you make, I mean, it, it $15 an hour is low for someone who's willing to babysit or cut grass or do whatever. I was averaging at least $25 an hour when I was cutting grass. I mean, these lawns, I had a zero turn mower. I had a couple of them and I had a couple of buddies who would help me often. But working by myself, I could average at least 25 sometimes $50 an hour doing that sort of thing. There's just all kinds of, and the economy has changed so much today. There's all kinds of available means for college students and young adults to make way more than minimum wage, way more than they would flopping whoppers. And the people who are willing, you talked about people who are willing to go and seek out work. Those are the people who are going to grow up, the college students who are going to grow up. And in their 30s and 40s, they're going to be running businesses because the skills that they've developed, the salesmanship skills, the entrepreneurial skills that they developed when they were younger. Actually, Tom Stanley, I think you're familiar with his work in The Millionaire Next Door and all those books. He's one of my favorite authors. And when he surveyed millionaires, one of the top things that they cited for their success was learning to work side jobs while they were in college and graduate school. And the other big thing that he cited, I think it was like something like nine out of 10 said that learning to think differently from the crowd when they were young is what allowed them to be successful today. And I just think that's so powerful. I cite his work a lot in the book because I'm such a huge fan and it's so meaningful. But his research, if we want to raise successful kids today, or if you're a college or graduate student and you want to be a millionaire when you're in your 30s or 40s, then that's the kind of stuff you got to do. Absolutely. And for listeners out there, put yourself in these shoes real quick. Let's say that you have your own business and you're hiring and you get two candidates that come out the college door. They graduate, they come out and one of them is candidate A and they came out and they crushed it in school. I mean, 4.0 GPA and I mean, just really, really smart. And that's where it ends. But they are just qualified 4.0 GPA and you get, you know, option B that comes out the door and they come up. They didn't have a 4.0 GPA. They had a 3.0 GPA. But on top of that, they also worked 40 hours a week. They got promoted to lead at their job. They managed a schedule. And on top of that, they did extra curricular volunteer opportunities or something like that. If I'm on the other side of that desk and I'm hiring, I'm looking at, okay, like this person's really smart over here, but I'm not looking for the smartest person in the room. I'm looking for somebody that has some real world experience that knows how to manage a schedule that can actually show up to work on time consistently. Cause that matters more to me than how well they did in calculus. 
And that's just me. But I think most business owners are going to agree with me on that. So the point is this. Working in college is not only going to help you not have debt, but it's going to help you get a job. That's my spiel. No, that's exactly right. I couldn't agree more. I know that's been the case for me, and I know it's been the case for a lot of other people that I know. For instance, one really big success story that I love to tout, and one other thing that goes along with the student loan, the free lending that we've talked about, is that nobody waits to go to school anymore. A generation ago, it was such a privilege to go to college that people would work several years just to save up money to go. You don't have to do that anymore because you can just walk up and get a student loan. But I've got a friend who uh, he went to college and his parents were able to help him pay for that and he got through that debt-free, but he wanted to go to dental school, but he didn't want to take out any debt. So what he did instead is he graduated college at 22 and then he went on and had, during his 20s, he had a sales career and he did really well in his sales career, but he saved up the money and he had a little bit of help from his parents again But he waited until he was 32 years of age to start dental school. He paid for the whole thing in cash. And by that point, he had already bought a house. He was married. His wife was working. Uh, So he put all that together, completely paid for dental school without any debt. And he graduated from dental school in his mid-30s. Now he came out, started working with a local dentist. She decided she wanted to retire. And she sold the practice to him. He now owns his own practice, completely free of debt. And he's making bank because he was willing to wait. And that's what I tell college students or graduate students. If you're looking at college or even if you're looking at law school or medical school or any kind of graduate degree, why do you have to go this year? You don't. Take a couple of years off, work, bank that money, go live with your parents if you have to for a year or two, or just live really cheaply. Patience is such a huge asset. And if you're willing to employ it, it can have such a big impact rather than just rushing into it and then having to pay for your decisions for decades into the future. I love it, Jordan. Jordan, I'm on the site right now, jordantehall.com. We'll put links in our show notes to that. But tell me about your book, Every Degree Debt-Free. I mean, this is, I'm looking at it. This is awesome because it just came out. But tell me a little bit about this book. Sure. I kind of divided it into thirds. The first third is kind of my story, how I went to college and then how I went to law school without debt. Focuses more on my time in law school just because it's a little more dramatic and I tell uh, some of the stories. But I was working insane hours through both, particularly through law school. But then the next third of the book kind of is my argument against student loans and why I believe they're so detrimental and why I believe there's a better way. And then the final third of the book kind of explains how I believe anybody can do it at any level, whether you're a college student looking at undergrad, you're 18, or you're 25 and you're thinking about going back to school. I share some other stories of other people who have done it successfully. And uh, I tell, of course, my story, but I also argue for why I think it's so important and there are so many benefits to approaching education differently than most people are approaching it today. Jordan, when you were writing this book, who is the person you were writing to on the other end that you envisioned was going to benefit from this book? I think I was looking at me when I was going through this and you know, I wanted to share my story to inspire other uh, young people who are doing it. But I was also thinking of parents because I know in your demographic, you said you reach up into the 40s with some of your listeners and those people, even you, Chris, I mean, I think your kids are what, five and seven right now? That's correct. As you know, we had a daughter 10 months ago and I can already see how fast things go. Before you know it, even people in their 30s and 40s are going to have kids who are looking at college soon. And like we talked about earlier with parents, if you can afford to pay for your kid's college, that's great. But that's not going to be the reality for a lot of people. And I kind of want to just take the guilt away from parents who can't. And to be honest, even if you can, I'm just a big fan of kids having skin in the game. Like that was one thing for me. I knew that I was paying for my education. So when I was in class, I was listening. I wasn't on somebody else's dime, just you know, kind of screwing around. Like I knew exactly how many lawns I had to mow to pay for that class. So I was going to get my money's worth while I was there. And I actually think this is a point you touched on earlier, but the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has done studies and uh, actually college kids who work up to 20 hours per week end up with better grades than kids who don't work at all. And I think that's just simply because they feel like they have an emotional stake in their education. And so that's one of the many reasons I cite for why I think working during school is such a big deal and why doing it without debt can be so beneficial. 100% agree. I love that. Have some skin in the game. When, when you're paying for it, it becomes real. When it costs you money, now it's real. When it costs somebody else money or when it costs you money later on, you don't feel it now, it's like, eh, I'm going to sleep in. I'm not going to class today. But when it's costing you money and it's like, this is 28 lawns I have to mow, you're <laughs> going to class. Like, absolutely. Jordan, where can we find out more about you? 
You can go to jordantehall.com. Um, got some information there, and I'm kind of blogging on this topic and on personal finance a little more generally. You can also look me up on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash Jordan Thomas Hall. And then we'll put links to your books on Amazon. We'll put links in the show notes to your book. End of every show, I ask our guests two questions. First question I have for you, besides the book that we just talked about, Every Degree Debt-Free, if there was one book that you could recommend for people to read, if you only had one choice, one time you could recommend one book, which book would it be? That's a great question. I would say it's hard to answer because I've got so many, but my very favorite book outside of the Bible is definitely Tom Stanley's The Millionaire Next Door. I read that one I don't know if I was in college or, or high school, but it changed my life. And if you read my book, you'll read a lot of references to Tom Stanley's books. Uh, it's just incredible, all the information. And along with The Millionaire Next Door, he followed that up with uh, The Millionaire Mind, which is an uh, incredible study of decamillionaires, people who are worth $10 million or more. And then Stop Acting Rich is uh, the sequel to that one. And they're all so good. I know you've read uh, all or some of those, and they're just amazing books. And I, I buy them regularly for other people because I just think it, they're so amazing. Absolutely. I 100% agree. All three books are on my probably my top 10, top 25 books that I love reading. Lastly is the picture on the home screen of your phone. What do you have? On the home screen of my phone, it is a picture of my daughter at Christmas time. She's sitting there uh, on the floor with a Christmas tree in the background. And that to me is the reason for debt freedom is that, you know, we just, she was born last year. And because we are completely debt free, my wife got to stay home with her. I get to uh, choose the time that I get to spend with her. I haven't sold my soul to be working and paying off debts, but I have the freedom to, to spend with my wife and, and daughter. And that to me is the ultimate reason that any of us would want to be debt free or have money is for those reasons. 100% agree. Hey, Jordan, this has been great. I love talking about something that's so obscure is that you could go out there and actually get a great education and you don't have to go into debt for it because like I said earlier, like we've been talking about, it's just so normal. And on this podcast, if you're listening, I want you to be normal, right? We've talked about this before. Normal is paycheck to paycheck. Normal is six out of 10 people can't write a check for $1,000. Normal is graduating college with $37,000 in student loan debt. And normal sucks. And I don't want you guys to be normal. I want you to take action. I want you to do things that are against the grain, against normal, and then be like Jordan and graduate law school and not have any debt or be like his dentist friend that goes and graduates, becomes a dentist, and now he's just making bank and he doesn't have any debt. And that's how life should be. And you get to create that if you want it. It's much easier to go out there and just get a student loan on the front end, but I promise you, lifelong, you are going to be so thankful that you went a route like Jordan did. So Jordan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing your story. And like I said, go hit his book up, Every Degree Debt-Free. We'll put links in the show notes to it. And uh, Jordan, you were a wonderful guest. Thank you so much, Chris. If you want to be successful, you got to be different. And just like that, we wrap up another amazing episode of the Money Peach Podcast. All the show notes, the links, anything that Jordan and I talked about be found over at moneypeach.com forward slash session 94. That's moneypeach.com forward slash session 94. Special thanks goes out to my producer, Steve Stewart, and my assistant, Kayla Sloan. Without them, this show would not be possible. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll see you next week, same time, same place, with another amazing episode of the Money Peach Podcast. Boom. 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 Boom.